Coming up, we're gonna go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1985. And this time around, we've got some of the biggest hits from the 80s, you know, duking it out for that number one spot. It was a legendary week for sure. You had Dire Straits, you had Billy Joel, Tears for Fears, Aretha Franklin, Huey Lewis in the News. They're all vying for the top of the charts, along with a great one hit Wonder. And somehow we've managed to pack in three parentheses songs, uh, three summer blockbuster hits, as well as some iconic music videos that solidified already great hits. It's 80s nostalgia to the max. It's gonna take you back to the best days of your life. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you are a bona fide child of the 80s, I'm telling you, this is your channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now, click the red button, click the bell so that you always know about our music history daily straight from the artist. You can also become an honorary producer on our Patreon. Check that out in the description. You get more content that helps us to keep it a daily channel. Also our merch, including our Vintage Years collection. You're gonna love that if you're a fan of the 80s, 70s. Got a 90s one as well. Oh, I'm excited. It's time for another edition of our show, The Hit Song Redux. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of rock and roll and re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on how much the world has listened to these songs since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. As always, we're including artists' interviews, their take, in-depth commentary, as well as your stories, your dedications. Now to clarify, this is not my personal top 10, it's the actual top 10 from this exact week uh, 37 years ago. First we count them down as they were, then we run through a recalibration process to find out the real top 10 based on all time streams and views. And uh, a little tip of the hat to my hero, Casey Kasem. So let's get into the proper pop culture context of the day. If you wanted to catch a movie back in the late summer of 85, you had a lot of great options. It Back to the Future. 88 miles per hour! The Goonies. The Goonies. Yeah. A Richard Donner film. Teen Wolf. Teen Wolf, a new comedy with Michael J. Fox, star of Back to the Future. <laughs> Weird Science. It's all in the name of science. Weird Science. View to a Kill. A View to a Kill. <laughs> National Lampoon's European Vacation. This summer, when you think vacation, watch out. Better Off Dead, just to name a few. I want my $2! They also re-released Ghostbusters, E.T., and Gremlins. I mean, are you kidding me? On the small screen, you could catch the first season of Moonlight. There is the sun and moon. You could also get Who's the Boss? There is more to life than Miami Vice. <laughs> Of course, there were the Saturday morning cartoons of the day. This time you had Thundercats. Thundercats. It's Voltron. Voltron, defender of the universe. And Transformers. So coming in at number 10, it's those guys who played their guitar on the MTV. It's Money for Nothing by Dire Straits. Money for nothing when you took some free. Dire Straits' fifth studio album, Brothers in Arms, really took off after the release of its second single, Money for Nothing, which sports one of the most memorable riffs of the 80s, one of my favorites for sure. A track that was riveting for its realism. It's also the culprit of uh, controversy. The lead character in Money for Nothing is based on a real person who worked at a New York retail store. Uh, while Mark Knopfler was shopping, as it goes, he overheard a conversation between a delivery guy and a worker who were watching MTV as it played on you know, multi-television displays inside the store. Uh, Knopfler borrowed a bit of paper and he just sat down within earshot and he began writing down the conversation that became Money for Nothing. Said Mark, I wanted to use a lot of the language the guy actually used when I heard him because it was just more real. 
The conversation between these two uh, meatheads, as Knopfler called them, included some hilarious lines that are now part of uh, our pop culture vernacular, along with you know, some homophobic and racial slurs that many in the media condemned. Uh, while watching the video on MTV, the song's narrator makes uh, jealous and really ignorant comments and playing rock stars make money by doing nothing, money for nothing. Knopfler took some heat for his lyrics. But Mark Knopfler, who had a background in, in journalism, he defended the lyrics. He cited the, their authenticity. But he said, as I was reporting verbatim what that particular guy thought of musicians, his exact words. Uh, Money for Nothing was a massive hit. It reached the top of the Billboard Hot 100, hit the top of the Rock Tracks chart. It's also a number one single in Canada. It went to number four in the UK and Australia. That's the way you do it. Let me tell you. Still one of those uh, recognizable songs from the 80s today. And of course, our viewers had a lot of memories about this song. Here's what some of them uh, said. Viewer Jonathan Main said, My college friends and I went to a mall in the KC area that had a store that would record your vocals over a backing track uh, for you to keep, and we did money for nothing. We changed out the derogatory F word, but sang all the verses while I handled all the sting parts. Uh, glad the operators there put a lot of echo on me. That's cool, I remember when they did that. Screen name uh, K24Skin said, got a rack stereo that had a compact disc player when our Camelot music had like 20 to 30 discs to choose from, each costing 17 to $19. I picked Dire Straits Brothers in Arms as one of the first two CDs I bought and would listen to the entire album at least once a day after school. It sounded amazing then, it still does today. Viewer Jan Kogel said, I hope I said your last name right. If I didn't, I apologize. But anyway, uh, Money for Nothing was pretty much the first song I recall being crazy about. Jumping around on the bed and playing air drums along with the intro. Never got the cues right, though still don't. My brother and I actually sold the old house last week and I couldn't resist putting on Brothers in Arms one last time during the final cleaning stage before we bid farewell to the place where we had enjoyed so much more music as time had progressed. Now that's cool. I went back to my old house too back in the day. It's really cool. Can't go home again, but you can try. That's the way you do it. Money for nothing and your chicks for free. Coming in at number nine is one of the the two extra tracks from the Greatest Hits Volume 1 and 2 collection from Long Island's favorite son. It's Billy Joel with Your Only Human, Second Wind, parentheses. Now back in the early 70s, Billy Joel's debut album, Cold Spring Harbor, flopped. It went to number 158 on the album charts, and he was depressed from you know, perceived professional and personal life failures. Billy Joel decided to take his own life. He said, I was suicidal. I just figured the world didn't need another failed musician. Luckily, however, his attempt at self-destruction went sideways. Billy Joel's words, I looked in my mother's closet and there was bleach and it had the skull and crossbones. And then there was furniture polish. At the time I thought, well, the furniture polish will probably taste better than the bleach. So I'll drink the furniture polish. And all I ended up doing was farting furniture polish for a couple of days and polishing my mother's chairs. <laughs> Very funny. Although he can laugh about it now. At the time, it was a serious cry for help that he would not forget. Later, Billy Joel was asked to write a song to help prevent uh, teenage suicide. And knowing that he could speak from experience, he agreed to do so. Uh, his first attempt it felt too dreary, too depressing. He didn't want to give troubled teens the wrong message, so instead he came up with the joyful, you're only human second wind. Its message would focus on personal forgiveness and being optimistic. It's all right sometimes, that's what it takes. Some people have, have uh, made fun of the song. I love this song. It's just a joyful song. Although Joel thought he sounded a bit too preachy on the track, the lighthearted nature of the music helped get his point across. Only human, you're gonna have to do 
Billy Joel wanted his listeners to understand that mistakes are a normal and vital part of life. Without them, you just can't grow. Back in 2016, Billy Joel actually said, I really think when you mess up, it's your own way of messing up, and it's completely original. It's not necessarily intended, but it's how you really find out who you are, how you get out of a mess. And actually, the laugh at the end of the song, that was a mess up that he kept in the song. So moving up to number eight, it's a group that had numerous hits in the 80s, starting with the party classic Celebration. This time it's a ballad. It's Cherished by Cool and the Gang. Cherished was the third single released from the band's 16th studio album, Emergency. Certified gold by the RIAA, Cherish peaked at number two on the Hot 100. It reached number one on the R&B chart, and it held down the top spot on the Billboard's AC chart for six weeks. Would ultimately become the biggest adult contemporary hit of the 80s. Somebody asked the other day what the AC charts are, adult contemporary charts. For the emergency album, Cool and the Gang opted to record in the Bahamas at Compass Point Studios. While working along the beach, lead singer James J.T. Taylor watched the band members' children uh, happily at play and thought to himself, how blessed we are. God has been good to us and we should cherish it. Taylor submitted the idea to the band's bass player, Robert Cool Bell, and he ran with it. Taylor, who wrote the lyrics, said it was the first time he'd ever written a song in one sitting without making any changes. However, producer uh, Jim Bonifond, uh, he wanted to reconstruct the song with new lyrics, and he brought in songwriter Sandy Linzer to do the deed. But Linzer thought the song was great as it was. He said, they used maybe a couple of lines in the chorus that I gave him gratis, but I thought the song was perfect. Apparently, he wasn't the only one. Behind the strength of Cherish, Emergency went on to become the group's biggest selling album. Went double platinum in the U.S. All right, as we arrive at the number seven position, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, that helps to make this possible. You know, in the waning days of summer, you can get ready for the fall with a brand new pair of Zennies. You pick the color, the shape, the style, everything. You just put in your prescription, and then Zenny will send them right to your front door for less than the price of a vinyl record. Go to zenny.com today. Coming in at number seven, uh, it's the Canadian Casanova. Who wouldn't dare take off his shades in the nighttime hours? Yeah, I'm talking about Corey Hart with Never Surrender. In the U.S., Hart notched a surprising nine top 40 hits between 1984 and 1990. I didn't know I had, had that many hits until I started thinking about it. Even more popular in his native Canada, where he reached the top 40 28 times. Although Sunglasses at Night may be his most familiar song, Never Surrender was Hart's biggest hit overall. Went all the way to number three on the Hot 100, and it went to number one in Canada. Actually won the Juno Award for Single of the Year. Never Surrender was the first single released from Hart's sophomore studio album, Boy in the Box, which reached the one million albums sold mark faster than any other Canadian artist in history. In 2012, Corey Hart explained the inspiration for his song. My mother influenced me with this ethic of never quitting on yourself or your dreams, no matter how challenging or how daunting. I also greatly admired uh, Sir Winston Churchill reading many biographies on his life. He used this expression, never surrender, you know, during the dark days of the Nazi attacks on Great Britain as a motivating inspiration for his countrymen. Certainly was a motivator for young Mike Wheeler during a makeout session with Eleven in the first scene of Stranger Things season three, the premiere. You have to remember that one. In the scene, the two kids are kissing when Mike starts singing along to the radio, but uh, Elle just isn't feeling it. Mike, you can never surrender. Stop. Meanwhile, Hopper spies on the kids while watching television. The lock, work the lock, don't look at the dogs. You look at the dogs. It's a great place, but I love how Stranger Things has, has brought so many of these classic songs from the 80s back into the spotlight. Come down. 
All right, coming into the number six position on the countdown, we have the songs from the big chair duo of Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith, otherwise known as Tears for Fears with the bombastic shout. Shout, shout. Songs from the Big Chair was Tears for Fear's second studio album, if you remember. And at this exact moment in 85, it was massively popular on both sides of the Atlantic. Reached number two in the UK and number one here in the US. Would go on to sell over six million copies. The record produced the number three single, Head Over Heels. And two chart toppers, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. This one shout. I'm to you. Come on. Bandmates Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith were disciples of American psychologist Arthur Janov, whose uh, school of primal therapy, primal scream therapy, directed people to confront their fears by shouting and screaming. Shout was at least in part inspired by this method. The band also talked about how it can be interpreted as a societal protest anthem encouraging people not to act without thinking. Written by Roland and keyboardist Ian Stanley, Orzabal said, the song was written in my front room on just a small synthesizer and a drum machine. Initially, I only had the chorus, which was very repetitive, like a mantra. I played it to Ian Stanley, our keyboardist. Of course, Chris Hughes, the producer, I saw it as a good album track. But they were convinced that it would be a hit. Now, the music video for Shout features footage of Orzabal and uh, Smith at Dirtle Door in Dorset, as well as an in-studio performance among family and friends. Uh, along with Everybody Wants to Rule the World, the Shout video helped establish Tears for Fears in the U.S. Well, thanks to its heavy airplay on MTV. Now, we got a lot of great comments about this song as well. Here's a couple. Viewer Tom Jones said, Shout, man, that song is just the best beat. Tribal pounding, foot stomping vibe. Always a treat to hear it. Viewer Robert Chattel said, The Tears for Fears Shout, I remember me and my family friends gathering in front of the television and singing along to the video back in 1985. I miss those moments in time and cherish them very much for sure. As do we all. Uh, screen name Sure W said, Songs from the Big Chair was one of the first cool tapes I owned. A friend had given it to me as a birthday gift around sixth grade. I love Tears for Fears and Shout. It's as iconic as it gets. Reminds me of my junior high days and the angst of heading into those teen years. Shout, shout, let it all out. It just feels so free. <laughs> Okay, so we've made it halfway through the countdown. In at number five, we've got another one of Canada's favorite sons. It's the hit machine Brian Adams with Summer of 69. Was it summer of 69? Now, in January of 85, Adams' fourth studio album, Reckless, started off strong. It peaked at number six on the Billboard 200 albums chart. Uh, for months afterwards, it hung around the top ten. And just when it started slipping down the charts, it had this amazing resurgence. That summer, under the strength of the singles Heaven, heaven. and Summer of 69, Reckless rebounded to claim the top spot, number one, a feat 38 weeks in the making. Dara spent two glorious weeks at number one, making Adams the first Canadian artist to top the album chart since uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive's Not Fragile in 1974. Not fragile. Although it was heaven that reached number one on the Hot 100, Summer of 69 has been the song that kept the party going for almost 40 years now. This one is a guaranteed nostalgia trip. I mean, this song takes you back to the best times of your life every time you hear it. And though this up-tempo rocker was an absolute rite of passage for every 80s kid, I do have to admit that it may not mean what I thought it meant when I was growing up. 
fact, people have debated this meaning for years. Is the song referring to an unforgettable uh, summer in 69? If you ask the song's co-writer Jim Valens, he'd be inclined to say yes. However, Brian Adams saw it differently. He said, it's really about summer love, and in my case, being a musician. I love the song Night Moves by Bob Seger, which is about getting laid in the summer, and I always wanted to write an answer to that song. There's a huge misconception that this song is about 1969, but it's not. The imagery in the song is about romance, nostalgia, being a struggling musician, and making love. If you want the full uh, in-depth breakdown of this song, we covered it a little while back, and I'll put a link for it to down below, and you can check that out if you want to see that in-depth. Our viewers had a lot to say about this one as well. Viewer Ash at home said, when I was in middle school, late 90s, early 2000s, my friends and I would randomly sing Summer of 69 very loudly in gym class. The gym teachers were not happy at all, but I was thrilled to introduce classic rock to my friends in an inappropriately hilarious way. And now the times are changing. Look at everything that's and viewer John Willome said, I hope I said your name right, uh, Summer of 69 was 15 and a dishwasher at a truck stop on the interstate. I had a transistor radio on top of the dishwasher and I got through the day by playing it all the time. I loved it when the song would come on. When I think back on that time, this is the only song that comes to mind. Screen name Big Boy Kermit 1980 said, cool screen name. The Summer of 69 is one of my most favorite songs of all time. When I was little, my grandmother and I would sit outside with the radio. and Every time that song came on, we couldn't help but sing. A few years later, I ended up buying the album. Every time I get a chance, I, I play that song. Reminds me of uh, good times and my grandmother. Very cool. Delving into the number four slot, it's the comeback queen of rock herself, Tina Turner, with We Don't Need Another Hero, Thunderdome, parentheses. We don't need another hero. This song was released on the heels of uh, Turner's 1984 multi-platinum album, Private Dancer, written by Terry Britton and uh, Graham Lyle. It's the theme song for the third installment of the post-apocalyptic uh, Mad Max series, of course, Beyond Thunderdome and it plays over the end credits. The movie, of course, starred Mel Gibson as Mad Max, who this time around, he plays opposite Tina Turner's villainous character, Aunt Entity. Turner also sang the opener, One of the Living. which was a number 15 hit on the Hot 100. It won the Grammy for uh, Best Award for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance. This was actually Tina Turner's first film role in more than a decade. But of course, she was no stranger to Hot 100 hits. We Don't Need Another Hero peaked at number two, coming up just short of being her second chart topper. Uh, What's Love Got to Do With It, uh, of course, holds that distinguished honor. Although it didn't claim the crown in the U.S., We Don't Need Another Hero did receive a Grammy nomination for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance. It also received a Golden Globe nomination for Best Original Song. And it hit number one in Canada, Germany, Australia, Spain, Poland, and Switzerland. So it was big all across the world. Okay, we're getting closer to that number one slot. In at number three, we have another great comeback story. Having been hitless for quite a few years, Aretha Franklin made a comeback with producer Narda Michael Walden and had her biggest hit in years. Number three, Freeway of Love. Freeway of Love written by Narda Michael Walden and Jeffrey Cohen. Uh, Walden is definitely the guy to call when you need to produce a pop diva. In addition to Aretha, he's written and produced some of the biggest hits for Whitney. and Mariah. Aretha Franklin has an incredible, count them, 20 number one R&B hits. It's actually more than any other artist. 
And though Free Away of Love was uh, her last number one hit on the R&B charts, it was a huge hit that revitalized her career. And it won Aretha Grammys for Best R&B Song and Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. Here's what Narda had to say about it. I was cutting uh, the Freeway of Love, Who's Zooming Who, at the Automatic Studios in San Francisco for Aretha and really uh, focused, because I knew that had to be right. And I got a phone call from Jerry Griffith from Arista Records. And Jerry said, I really want you to work on a song for Whitney Houston. I said, Jerry, I don't have time. I'm really right in the middle of making this Aretha record. And he knew that. But he said, but you don't want to sleep on this because she'll be, she'll be a big artist. All right, so we've made it to number two, the runner-up position. And it just so happens to be the one-hit wonder or bottle lightning hit of the year, in my opinion. One of my favorite songs when I was about 10 years old. It's St. Elmo's Fire, Man in Motion, parentheses, by John Parr. Teaming up with David Foster, John Parr wrote this song for the movie St. Elmo's Fire, which starred Brat Pack alums uh, Judd Nelson, Emilio Estevez, Ali Sheedy, Demi Moore, Rob Lowe, and Andrew McCarthy. You're not going to believe how out of hand it's going to be. However, St. Elmo's Fire was also written with someone else in mind, paraplegic Canadian athlete Rick Hansen, who was injured in a car crash at the age of 15. On March 21st, 1985, Hansen began his Man in Motion tour, traveling up to 70 miles a day to raise money for spinal cord research. First, Hansen struggled to create awareness for this cause, but after the song was released with the movie in June, it became his anthem. And as the St. Elmo's theme rose up the charts, interest in Hansen's pilgrimage grew. Describing how the song came together, John Parr said, I wrote the lyric when we were working on the movie. David showed me a video of Rick Hansen, and I was inspired to write the story of his planned epic journey to circumnavigate the globe in his wheelchair. Now, I wrote the lyric ambiguously so that the film company would think all I need is these pair of wheels referred to you know, Demi Moore's Jeep, when actually I'm referring to Rick's wheelchair. <laughs> Or for once in his life, a man has his time actually refers to when Rick would end his journey wheeling back into Vancouver with a million people lining the streets. <laughs> Not when Emilio Estevez finally kisses Andy McDowell. Uh, by the time the Man in Motion tour was completed on May 22, 1987, Hansen had put nearly 25,000 miles on his wheelchair, uh, crossing 34 countries on four continents. In total, he raised $26 million and became a Canadian national hero. Amazing. All right, here we are. We finally made it to the number one song of this same week 37 years ago. For this one, we need to take a ride in the DeLorean back to October 26, 1985. Because it's Back to the Future's most iconic track, The Power of Love by Huey Lewis and the News. That's the power of love. Power of Love was actually released before the movie and it entered the Hot 100 at number 46 on uh, June 29th. The film was released on July 3rd in the US and of course it rocketed the number one at the box office. Steven Spielberg presents Back to the Future, a Robert Zemeckis film. It actually stayed there until late September. It was only interrupted one time by National Lampoon's uh, European vacation. It was for a week in, in July. National Lampoon's European vacation. Although the power of love took longer to claim that top spot, it got there all the same on August 24th and stayed there for two weeks. Now, I had a chance to sit down with Huey Lewis and get the backstory about this iconic song. It's one of my favorite interviews. Here's what he said about it. They asked to have a meeting with us. That's Spielberg who produced it, Zemeckis who directed, and Bob Gale who wrote it. The way they framed it is they said, look, we've just written this film, and our, and our lead character, Marty McFly, his favorite band would be Huey Lewis in the News. So we thought, why not ask you to write a song? I said, fine, love to don't know how to write for film necessarily, and frankly, don't much 
care for writing a song called Back, Back to, to the, the Future. Future. And they went, no problem. We don't care what it's called. We just want one of your songs. And, and that turned out to be super smart because the next thing we, I said, well, I'll just send you the next thing we write, which was Power Love. And so they used it in a chase scene and they loved it. I'm late for school. Let me know if you want to see the full Power Love uh, vignette. Well, there you have it. The top 10 songs from this same week in 1985. So now it's time to see how each song has fared 37 years later uh, after running it through our recalibration system. All right, I got to tell you, there were some really big shakeups this time around. So drum roll, please. Here we go. At number 10, it's Your Only Human Second Win by Billy Joel with 11 million streams. Only human, you're going. Falling six spots to number nine is Aretha with Freeway of Love tallying 21 million streams. At number eight, Never Surrender by Corey Hart turning in 38 million streams. Coming in at number seven with 115 million streams is We Don't Need Another Hero by Tina Turner. And at number six, tumbling four spots, John Parr St. Elmo's Fire, Man in Motion, totaling 161 million streams. Halfway through at number five, we got Cool in the Gang's Cherish, uh, checking in with 184 million streams. Coming in at number four with 343 million streams. It's a Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the News, so that means it got a new number one. That's the power of love. At number three, it's Shout by Tears for Fears, cashing in 413 million streams. Shout, shout, let it all out. Making a massive jump from 10 to 2, it's Dire Straits and Money for Nothing with an amazing 634 million streams. All right, we finally made it. The only one left. Did you figure it out? Coming in at number one for this exact same week in the summer of 1985, fittingly, it's Brian Adams, summer of 69, with a magnificent 1.2 billion streams. Was it summer of 69? So there it is, the new top 10 from this very same week in 1985 based on all time streams and views. Make sure to share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the new top 10? Now, if we didn't get to your dedication or your memory, we will keep sharing uh, with us in the comments. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe so you never miss out on one of these countdowns or interviews. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon. That really helps us to keep this a daily channel. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.